House of Squibb presents Academy Awards. Every week, Squibb brings you Hollywood's finest. The great picture plays, the great actors and actresses, techniques and skills chosen from the honor roll of those who have won or been nominated for the famous Golden Oscar of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science. And now, E.R. Squibb and Sons, manufacturing chemist of the medical profession since 1858, bring you the distinguished actress, Irene Dunn, who has four times been nominated for the Academy Award as Best Actress of the Year. You will hear her tonight, starring in The White Cliffs of Dover with Sir Aubrey Smith. Both Miss Dunn and Sir Aubrey Smith will play the roles they created on the screen in this dramatic picture, which, for Best Photography of the Year, was nominated for the 1944 Academy Award. I have loved England dearly and deeply since that first morning, shining and pure, the white cliffs of Dover I saw rising steeply out of the sea that once made her secure. I have loved England, and still as a stranger, here is my home, and I still am alone. Now in her hour of trial and danger, only the English are rarely her own. Susan... I'm so glad you're on duty. I wanted to talk to you. Please do, Colonel Lawrence. Have you heard from your son? He phoned to say his leave was cancelled. I've heard nothing since. It's five days now. I'm terribly worried. Naturally. We've not heard from our boys either. Well, I suppose you were told to stand by for emergency? Yes. This is confidential, Susan. I've been notified by the General's aide to prepare for casualties within the next 24 hours. He anticipates a possible 5,000. So many. I suppose I mustn't ask questions. Your guess is as good as mine. Obviously a big show. And we have such a little hospital here. Invasion? Hardly. Raid on the French coast, possibly. Hmm, on a big scale by the sound of it. Is that... Yes, I think so. They usually start at dawn. <laughs> Cigarette? No, thanks. I don't seem to want it. I guess I'm hit all right. No pain? No. Maybe it's like this before you... Funny to think of coming all the way from, from Iowa to die in a place like this. What do they call it? Dieppe. Yeah, yeah, Dieppe. You're English, aren't you? More or less. My mother was American. You're wounded, too. Bad? I think so. Well, we're, we're out of it. Yes. But I say, better start rolling away. A nasty dive bomber. loved England dearly and deeply since that first morning, shining and pure, the white cliffs of Dover I saw rising steeply out of the sea that once made her secure. I had no thought then of husband or lover. I was a traveler, the guest of a week. Please tell me, young lady, you came 3,000 miles to spend two weeks in the bedroom of a Bloomsbury boarding house? Oh, don't rub it in, Colonel Morris. But, my dear child, you must stay over. See something of England. Why, this is April. April 1914. Well, I've seen a great deal of London. The British Museum, the National Portrait Gallery, oh, and... Oh, great heavens. British Museum, eh? Saw the mummies, what? Huh? Been to any shows? Any no. dances? No, I... 
I'm afraid my father... Speaking uh, of dancing, I, I'm afraid I can't play cards tonight. It's the night of Millicent Waverley's ball. Thought I might go this time. Where so the king and queen are going. Uh, have you received your invitation, Colonel? <laughs> no, by Jove, I haven't, though. No. I must give Millicent a ring. Care to come to this shindig with me tonight? You mean... I don't know you... if that sort of thing interests you, but everybody will be there from the king down. <laughs> nice. You've been neglecting me. I haven't been in tail since your last, Millicent. This is Miss Susan Dunn of the United States, Duchess of Waverley. My dear, I'm so glad you could come. I... Oh, thank you. Nothing less would have brought this old bear out. See that he gets you some acceptable partners. I haven't enjoyed myself so much for years. Oh, you dance lightly as a feather, Colonel. You're very kind. Now, for dancing with me, you're going to have your reward. I'm going to find a delightful young man for you to dance with. Back in a moment with a captive. Don't run off. John Ashwell! Oh, well met. The very man I'm looking for. Glad to see you, sir. Oh, it's been ages. I brought a girl. Oh, charming girl. Promised her a topping partner. Now, you'll fill the bill. Uh, well, fact is, sir, I, I have a sort of appointment. Bertie's cousin from Australia. Girl I've never seen. He can't get here till later. I promised I'd take care of her. Well, how are you going to find her if you've never seen her? I'm to wait in the Adam room. It's early yet, but I want to be the first on the scene. Hmm, in the Adam room, eh? You know where the Adam room is? Uh, see there, my boy. That double door behind the palm. That's what you're looking for. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm sorry I can't oblige, but uh, duty must be done, eh? Oh, of course, of course, of course. Well, good hunting. Oh. Oh. Hello. Uh, you must be Bertie's cousin, Nancy. I'm John Ashwood. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Well, I... I... No, no, not at all. I came early. I thought I'd be the first. It's awful to be uh, hanging around when you don't know anyone. Yes, isn't it? Oh, I suppose the colonel sent you. No, Bertie sent me. Uh, he told me to tell you that he'd be late. He's detained at the foreign office. <laughs> the weekly crisis, I suppose. He said you were not to wait supper for him, but to try and behave as if I were he. Do you think you can? Well, yes, I'm sure, quite easily, but... But I'm afraid... I hear this is your first visit to England. Yes, it is. And I... you're not staying very long. No, indeed. No time at all. In fact... Oh, that's too bad. We must make the most of it, mustn't we? May I have the pleasure of this dance? Why, yes, I should love to. This is my favorite waltz. Mine, too. Splendid. Why did it stop? king and queen. The king and queen. Oh, what shall I do? Just curtsy. But I, I, Shh. I... Here they come. Did I do all right? <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, you must think I'm dreadfully awkward, but we don't do that sort of thing at home. Uh, you, uh, you haven't been presented at court? Good gracious, no. I'm just a small town girl. But, uh, um, Bertie said you were Australian. Oh, oh, yes, of course. In all the excitement I'd forgotten. I'm not Nancy. I'm not Bertie's Australian cousin. I'm an imposter. Good heavens, I say. Oh, are you really? Well, who are you? Nobody in particular. I come from a dull little town called Tulliver in the smallest state in the USA. Well, why didn't you tell me? But you didn't give me much time. Besides, I... I sort of wanted to dance with you. Oh, did you? Oh, good. I say, that's, uh, that's splendid. Uh, are you living in London? No, we're, we're going home tomorrow. But I've just met you. You can't go back tomorrow. I can't allow it. You don't want to. Uh, do you? No, I don't, but my father does. You see, it's rained every day, and... and... He's a bit prejudiced about England anyway. Now, look here. 
I'd like to talk to your father, get him to let you stay. You simply can't go away now. Good morning, Miss Dunn. Oh, dear. Good morning, sir. I know this is not an opportune moment, and I hope you'll forgive me. Father, uh, this is Sir John Ashwood. He brought me home last night. Glad to meet you. Sorry we have more time. Fact is, we're a bit rushed. Our train leaves at 10. Mr. Dunn, my mother lives in Devon, and yeah. at any moment she may call you on the telephone. Yeah. My mother would be delighted if you and Miss Dunn could spend a week or two with us, see some typical English country hold life. Hold on, hold on. There is out of the question. Good heavens, man, we're practically on the train, and we don't know your mother. She doesn't know us. I've come for the trunk, Governor. Right there. Now, I'm sorry, Mr., but I run a newspaper, and I've got to get back to it. Uh, Mr. Dunn, a telephone call. Oh, sir. Lady Jean Ashton. Tell her I've gone. Tell her... Susan, why do you stand there like a wooden Indian? Say something. Tell this obstinate young man that you can't go. Tell him you don't want to stay. But, but I do, Father. What? I want to very much. You see, Step sir... out of this. Your cab, sir. I'm holding the line, Mr. Dunn. And let me stay a week or so, Father. You go back alone. Well, of all the unfeeling... Just a few weeks, sir. I'll catch the next boat. We'll take care of her, sir. The I cab, promise. sir. The phone, Mr. Dunn. Holy mackerel... Hello, hello, Dunn speaking, Hiram P. Dunn. And this about winds up our tour of the old place, Sue. Except for the portraits. I'm not going to bother you with the others, but this gorgeous officer is the present baronet and your humble servant. <laughs> It's so beautiful, all of it. Like a dream. Me too. You too. I'd like to show you everything in this world. We'd begin with England. We'll drive down the Roman roads where Caesar's legions marched and follow Chaucer's steps to Canterbury. I'll show you the Isle of Avalon where King Arthur died and the Holy Grail is buried. Places with lovely names. St. Just of Roseland, where Henry VIII honeymooned with Anne Boleyn, and Tintagel, where Isilt waited for a white sail. Jolly places. Uh, there's a moat at Wells where the swans swim and ring a bell for dinner when they're hungry. I say, you're crying. I'm not. At least, I don't want to. You see that space on the wall near my portrait? That's where my wife's portrait will hang. You must have often wondered what she'd be like. I have. Until a few days ago. Then I began to hope that she'd be... tall and fair... with a mind of her own... and that when my great-grandson showed visitors her portrait, he'd say... My great-grandmother. Lovely, isn't she? She was an American. Oh, John... Oh, well, you must have known. I've been out of my mind since I peeped behind that potted palm and saw you in the Adam room. I, I meant to wait to give you more time, but it's out now. And you're wondering what I'll say? Yes. What will you say? I think, I think, John, if, if your great-grandson is to show his friends that portrait, it'd best be about finding a good artist. <laughs> The stars brighten and their eyes are clear to see God's image in their common clay. Is it the music of the spheres they hear in this sweet prelude to that noble play, the drama of joined lives? Ah, they forget. They cannot write their parts. The bell has rung, the curtain rises, and the stage is set for tragedy. They were in love and young. <laughs> My darling, uh, the car's waiting. You'd better slip away and change. I will, but I'll dread each wasted moment away from you. Oh, it was the most wonderful wedding in the world. I shall never, never, never marry anyone but you. Oh, I no. swear it. I say, I say a toast. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think it's high time we drank to the union of the old world and the new. To our dear young friend and the charming lady who said with Ruth of old, thy people shall be my people. Ladies and gentlemen, to the health and happiness of Sir John and Lady Ashwood. Yeah. Yeah. Just a moment, John. Forgive me, I, I'm late. 
Forgive me for bringing bad news. John, this came for you. Telegram from the war office. John, what is it? What is it, Colonel? A joke? No joke, sir. England's at war. favorite time of the year for many of us is Indian summer. The September and October days when trees are flaming red and gold, when there's a rich fragrance of harvest in the air, when nights are so crisply cool, the crackle of an open fire is music to our ears. Autumn is more than a season. It's an exhilarating, refreshing experience. And in its own way, Squib Dental Cream is like that. Not just another dentifrice, but a genuine delight to use. Refreshingly different. You'll like its pungent, fresh mint zest, its brisk, exhilarating action. And you'll appreciate how effectively the safe, soft, polishing agent in Squib Dental Cream brings out the natural sparkle of your smile. All of these distinctive advantages of Squib Dental Cream are assured by 223 scientific tests behind every tube. So brush your teeth with the modern dentifrice, the refreshing dentifrice. Ask for Squib Dental Cream, one of the great family of Squib products. Taste, feel, and see the refreshing difference. In a moment, we will continue with part two of the White Cliffs of Dover. But first, we would like to call your attention to another Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, the Technicolor musical Holiday in Mexico, starring Walter Pidgeon, Jose Turby, Jane Powell, Ilona Manxi, and Xavier Cugat. Holiday in Mexico may currently be seen at your local theater. Now the House of Squibb presents part two of Academy Awards, starring Irene Dunn in the White Cliffs of Dover with Sir Aubrey Smith. He got leave after months in the filthy trenches. My love sent for me, and I crossed the channel to meet him in the little French hotel at Dieppe. We heard the sea murmur. We saw the full moon wane, knowing that our happiness might never come again. I, not forgetting till death do us part, was outrageously happy with death in my heart. My love, to be here, I just don't have the words. We don't need words, John. Look, the moon. One would think there was no war going on. Well, we can't spend what's left of my leave on the view. I'm hungry. And there's the champagne. Oh, of course, dear. <laughs> it's grand that, that you and Mother hit it off so well. Does she bully you? She does. To hear her, you'd think I was doing it just to be contrary, because I'm an American. Doing what? Well, I should say not doing it. <laughs> not doing what? Oh, well, John. Sue, you're blushing. Come to that, you, you look pretty pink yourself. I say... This wouldn't have anything to do with young Percy, would it? John, Percy. The eldest son's always called Percy, dear. Uh, not my eldest. Our eldest. But I don't like the name Percy. Well, I don't like it very much myself. But the eldest son's always called Percy. Why? Tradition. My boy will be called after the man I love, his father. And his name will be John. I am sorry, monsieur. But you asked me to call if the message came. It has come. No. Oh, no, my darling. No. No, I won't let you go back. I won't. I won't let you go back and be murdered. You can't. Don't you see? Not now. Oh, my darling, darling. I don't want to leave paradise, but I have no choice. Come on. One more glass. One for the road back to hell. <laughs> So, 
Bolton, my dear. At last you've come to London for the great event, eh? Where's that boy of yours? Here he is, John Ashwood Esquire. So this is John's boy. <laughs> and mine too, Colonel. Fine lad. He looks like John. If it hadn't been for me, you know, I have a bit of a share in this young fellow. Of course, dear friend. You brought us together that wonderful night at the ball. Now, here they come. <laughs> Let me lift Johnny up. Look, my child. Look, young man. Those are your mother's people. See how well they march. Your mother's people and yours too. Because you're half a Yankee, you little Englishman, and I'm never going to let you forget it. Wave your hand, Johnny. Wave your hand. <laughs> I say, I can't hear you. Hello. Hello. Ashford? Is that the manor house? Who is this? Oh, I can't hear. An infernal racket here. I say, have you heard the news? Oh, pity. Thought I'd be the first to tell you it. <laughs> Wonderful, it's over, eh? Yes, armistice. You, you should hear it here in London. The town's gone mad. Let me speak to her. Lady Ashwood, I mean. Huh? I don't hear you. Speak up. What? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, my God. Oh. Great heavens. No. What can I say? What can I say? John dead? <laughs> I do not remember the words that they said. Killed, Dewey, November. I knew John was dead. All done and over that day long ago. The white cliffs of Dover, little did I know. Ah, oh, look at the fat legs of him. I declare I never saw one grow so fast. Not yet a year old. Yes, he's... Fine and strong, my baby. He'll grow up tall and straight, and he'll go into the army. The eldest sons always go into the army. It's a family tradition. A tradition to die young in a country not your own. A tradition to die young for honor and glory. But my baby will live out his life. I'll teach him to run and hide when the drums start playing. I'll keep him safe. I don't know how... But I'll keep him safe. Do you understand? And then again to see in anguish and in doubt the lights of Europe falter and go out. And once again the feet of marching men drum in the darkness. Once again. Our days were busy with a thousand cares. Our nights were dark and quiet with our prayers. Now here, the wounded. It was Diepsusen and bad. Only a handful have come back. Not, not my boy. Yes, Susan, he was there. Where is he? In there on the cot. My John. At Dieppe? Oh, no, no. Susan. How bad is he? Bad. How long? A few hours. Hello, Mother. John. I have a letter an American boy gave me before we got it over there at Dieppe. Mail it, will you? It, it's uh, not readable, I'm afraid. Oh, yes, bloody, you mean. Uh, will you write her another? Yes, dear. Good. You know, it's funny to think I never saw your home. 
I wish I had. And then I'd know how close we were. That chap, that American. Yes. He said, he said he'd really start to fight the day the war ended for a good peace. A peace that would stick, that nobody could kick around. You see, he didn't know he was going to die. He didn't know. Yes, dear. He didn't know. And I'll write a letter to his mother. Tell her. Tell her he did very well. Yes, I'll tell her. Hey, you've got to go now. There's work for you to do. I'll be all right. I... Good night, Mother. And thanks. Good night. My darling boy, and God bless you, and God keep you. Amen. I have loved England dearly. And dearly, too, husband and son. Now at the end, I know they would have me do what must still be done. I was American born and American bred from a hickory shore. We shall not turn away from the dead as we did before. We shall not turn away till the air is bright and the day is set. They had a dream like glory and morning light. And we have it yet. There is much that each of us can do to help shape the kind of world in which we shall now live. It is the serious personal duty of every American, for example, to keep abreast of all proposals for the direction and control of atomic energy. It is the duty of the scientist to turn all advances made in time of war to the enrichment of men's lives in time of peace. Scientists at the House of Squibb are devoting themselves night and day to learning more about the miraculous new drugs discovered during the war. The House of Squibb shouldered enormous responsibilities in the development of these drugs, and now Squibb is contributing to their further refinement, wider distribution, and ever-increasing application. For as long as there is pain and suffering in the world, Squibb will be dedicated not only to the search for new drugs, but to the perfection of medical aids already known, whether they be professional products for your doctor or simple home health essentials for your daily use. Remember that whenever you're buying for your own medicine cabinet, to be sure you get Squibb quality, always ask for Squibb. A name you can trust. Next Wednesday, another great picture. The House of Squibb will present Academy Award Guest in the House with Anita Louise, Joan Loring, and Kirk Douglas. Today's performance of The White Cliffs of Dover was written for radio by Frank Wilson with an original musical score composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Our producer-director is D. Engelbach. Irene Dunn can currently be seen in the 20th Century Fox production Anna and the King of Siam. Sir Aubrey Smith is soon to be seen in the Cecil B. DeMille Paramount production, Unconquered. This is Hugh Brundage bidding you good night until next Wednesday at the same time when you're invited to listen again to Academy Award, presented by the House of Squibb, a name you can trust. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.